All right. This is Darren. This is On the Economy with Sonoma Wealth Advisors. And I'm Chris Sipes. So before we get going, like always, uh, just make sure we mention that this is part of our due diligence process that we open up to everyone to share with you what we're looking at on the economy, what we see out there. Uh, it's not meant to be individual advice for anyone because certainly we don't know who's watching this and what your specific situation is. Feel free to reach out should you have any specific questions. So generally, Chris, what's out going on out there? What are we seeing in the economy? Uh, so economy is starting to heat up. We, of course, got the stimulus finalization last week and stimulus checks starting to hit uh, bank accounts late last week and into this week. So um, market really hasn't rallied much the last couple days off of that is kind of was going to be expected. It's one of those uh, buy the rumor, sell the news situations, it sounds like. So market seems to be a bit worried about rates, interest rates ticking up. Uh, we've we've been hovering around that 160 on the 10 year yields. Uh, and so markets have been struggling with that. We've also seen dollar strength, which is a reversal of what we've seen the last six months or so. So those two things are kind of playing into the overall structure of the economy that's kind of uh, created a little bit of volatility within the markets, I would say over the last week or two. We've got the Fed meeting coming up. And so market participants are wondering, you know, what they're going to say about about rates and, and new programs or no new programs. And, and there always seems to be a little volatility going into these Fed meetings. Yeah, we tend to see this real kind of, uh, I would say, a quieter week, Monday, Tuesday, leading up to Wednesday. What happens on Wednesday is Jerome Powell comes out, they release these notes at uh, around 11 o'clock. Then he goes on and he does his press conference and the market goes haywire during the, the press conference. You can just watch it going up and down. And one of the classic new trader mistakes is while he's talking to make a trade during that period of time because the market's just up and down. And then as soon as he wraps up his speech and the mic drops, that's when you tend to see the market head off in whatever direction it's going to go. So, you know, there's really three themes that we're going to talk about tonight. One is deflation and inflation. That continues to be the theme that we're seeing economically out there. The second theme is this really kind of, we'll call it the retail versus the institutional trading in the markets. That's certainly, the, there's all these participants. I was listening to a statistic earlier today, and there's three times the number of accounts were opened at Schwab during last March than ever during last a March period of time. So a lot of people coming into the market. We got stimmy checks hitting everyone's accounts. I've got multiple people letting me know that they got a stimmy check today. And, uh, you know, I certainly think some of that's going to flow into the market on some level um, or another. I uh, just got to love that we actually have a nickname for stimulus <laughs> checks now. Um, yeah. It's become such a normal part of uh, our, our existence, I guess. Uh, so that's all um, I think um, really important. We're going to and we're continue to see that uh, devaluation of the dollar and what the dollar is doing and how that's impacting uh, the economic framework. But it would not be a Sonoma Wealth Advisors on the economy broadcast unless we started off didn't start off with a cartoon because you know this is how us nerds get our laughs during the day when we're staring at <laughs> charts. Uh, yeah. So what are we looking at here? Well, inflation is very simply the, the loss of your purchasing power is kind of the traditional uh, definition of it. However, as we've been talking about a lot lately, because this is the biggest debate within the professional money management uh, environment right now is, is inflation versus deflation. Um, and, and we can see inflation in different places. So the, the most common one that's cited is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Um, and that tracks a certain basket of goods uh, in a certain way. However, you can get inflation in asset prices. Um, if anybody's been working on their house recently, you can f find that there's a limited supply of, of the things you need to work on your house, build your house. And so there can be inflation in those types of prices. So inflation can pop up all over the place. Um, wage inflation, which we haven't seen in a long, long time, um, is also a driver. So it kind of... What what inflation do you mean at the end of the day, right? Well, and I think that's really the, the thing that's going on out there, right? Because you've got the, the Fed saying, oh, there's a little bit of inflation. Even Janet Yellen, uh, the Treasury Secretary, came out last week and she said, well, we see some inflation, but we can control it. 
but what else is she going to say when someone asks her, if, hey, is there inflation? Like, yeah, we see lots of it and we have no idea how to control it. <laughs> it's not yeah. going to happen, right? So Good point. The, the, the very fact that she says, yeah, we see a little bit of it and we, we can manage it tells me in my that in her mind, she's looking at this thing going, yeah, we see inflation and can we control it? And that's the question they're answering now at the Fed and trying to figure out. Otherwise, she wouldn't have made that comment like that, right? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I came across this one earlier this week, this meme. Got, got to love the memes on social media, right? They make the world go around these last year. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we're almost out of this where we don't have uh, COVID jokes anymore. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it, w- it would seem that I think we've got a, uh, a large possibility of another wave coming at us. I think there are seeing some issues in Europe with getting the vaccines out there. The AstraZeneca news is really interesting where there's actually, um, you know, countries saying you're not deporting our vaccines if they're manufactured in that country. And I think that was Italy who did that. Uh, so there, there's kind of this wrangling happening over, um, the, uh, the, um, just over whether or not the vaccines, um, mm-hmm. are going to get out or not. Well, it's just a sign of society these days, right? I mean, we, we could look at any any object and any uh, subjective thing and and you're going to get 50% of people that say, you know, it's one way and 50% of people that say it's another. There's no, uh, there's never going to be a consensus on anything, it feels like, that's for sure, or anywhere even near a consensus. So, you know, get, getting back to those three themes Chris I was talking about earlier, inflation, deflation, we've got this early cycle, late cycle. So is this the beginning of a cycle? You're going to see in a lot of the data we're going to present to you tonight that it's more likely, at least what the data is saying right now, that we're early cycle on this. Uh, and what do I mean by early cycle? I mean early cycle in a recovery, early cycle in a boom market, early cycle in a bull market. Uh, and then you've got this kind of retail trader versus institutional trader dynamic going on in the market, which is a new theme and certainly impacting economic data uh, to what degree arguable, but certainly an impact out there. Chris, did you want to say anything about this one? I thought we just put it up. I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, no, it's uh, this one actually wasn't meant to be a joke. This is a kind of all in one card on some things that <laughs> that you can do to keep it simple. You know, it's really fun to talk about all these macro themes. And when we talk about the charts and try to, you know, uh, squeeze every penny out of the trades and, and all that. that That's kind of the, the fun part of, of building wealth and, and uh, investing. And we love to talk about it. But really, when you look at it, there's some very simple things uh, that if you just learn and apply regularly, it's kind of like the old, you know, if you just eat your vegetables, eat healthy, get some exercise, you're probably going to live a long, healthy life, right? You don't have to be, you know, running 10 miles a day and, and you know, working out two hours a day to, to, to have that. So this is one of those, those levers that if you just kind of pull on some basic levers, you can get really 80 to 90% of the, the returns. Um, and so I, we saw this this week and I just thought it was uh, good for people to, to check it out and just kind of zoom out for a minute and simplify things a bit. You know, the old, as the old saying goes, there's no silver bullet, right? And there really isn't in finance. It's really simple, basic rules that if you yeah. follow and you're disciplined to, uh, you're more likely to be successful financially uh, than otherwise. And I, I have calls all the time with uh, people talking to us, interested in working with us, et cetera, where it's just, it's, you know, it's simple. It's like, look, you're doing everything you should be doing. I don't see any reason to change what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's great you're asking the question uh, whether or not, uh, you know, there's anything else you can do. But at the end of the day, it's very simple, tactical things that really help you reach financial freedom. Mm-hmm. So this, this inflation, deflation is really important. Early cycle, late cycle, retail trader versus institution, what the impacts on the markets are because of that. Uh, and uh, we got this headlines coming through from Philip Briggs and Miracle, whoever they are. I don't know them. Is it a law firm? Oh. This was came out of Goldman Sachs, right? Did I lose you, Chris? We can't hear you. I hear you clicking, but I can't hear you. There we go. You. I okay. lost audio for a second. Sorry about that. So this was actually from, uh, from Goldman Sachs. So... They expect um, two tri- with the with the expected two trillion dollar infrastructure, which is supposed to come after this stimulus. Um, 
they think that which it could be two, but it could be as high as four trillion, which is just massive, mind blowing numbers there. Um, the that's along with expanding the child care, health care, education, etc. They expect a GDP of six of seven percent. Now I've seen six percent. I've seen as high as eight percent estimates on GDP, which just to give you an idea, normal a kind of more recent normal growth rate is what two percent. Um, and so if we got a six to eight percent jump in GDP, that would be massive, right? But that seems to be pretty much consensus. Consensus. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the crazy thing is what these economists are coming out with. If we really get that level of GDP anywhere past what, you know, two or three uh, is huge. I mean, these are these are the numbers that China was throwing at us for many, many years that everyone looked at and said, these are fake numbers. And now we're putting out numbers like that. So you take that kind of growth trajectory, that kind of push into the economy and look at this is um, what you're looking at these different bull markets throughout history. Going back to that theme I just talked about, are we early cycle, late cycle? You know, stuff like that suggests that we're very early cycle, that this is just getting going. The heat's just coming down the pipe uh, and get ready because this this thing's going to move fast and furious. doesn't mean that it's not going to have a ton of volatility to it. Uh, I think that's to be expected uh, given, and that goes back to that retail institutional trader. You just have so many different players in the market that are going to move the stock market up and down, but that might have nothing to do with the economy, right? And we mm-hmm. always got to bifurcate those two things, right? Because you've got the economy and you've got the stock market. What's looking economically, things are looking really positive. We do think that that would then ultimately push the stock market up further. Yeah, you got it. And I think I think part of it is that we just went through that downturn last March through COVID, uh, where things were were falling apart. We actually today is the one year anniversary where the S and P was down something like twelve percent, and uh, which is the third worst d- daily drop in stock market history. I mean, just thinking back to that is kind of crazy. And I think there's, I don't I don't know how to explain it. Maybe like a survivor's guilt. I don't know if you would agree with this, Darren, where it feels like. Okay, we had this massive impact to the economy, which was the global pandemic and, and eco- economies all over the world shutting down. However, from an economic standpoint, really the pain was pretty quick for for a lot of people, right? When you look at, if you're measuring it based on the stock market. Well, I, th- I think we have to look at the pain in, in what subsets of the population, because I think as we look at the data yeah. night, that it's very different experience for the lower income, lower educated uh, yes. Portions of the population are still struggling. Absolutely. The K-shaped recovery, but the the folks that were not impacted as much, we'll, we'll so, show some slides tonight where the, the net worth is actually expanded, right? And so this chart is showing the U.S. personal income. So this has got to be one of the first uh, recessions in history where personal income actually went up. Right. And and we spread this out over a longer period of time just so you can get an idea of the massive size of the increase in personal income compared to anything we've seen since pre great financial crisis. And typically in a recession, incomes go down. And uh, and so I, I, I getting back to that whole like survivor guilt, I feel like there is a bit of, um, you know, we never had to take our medicine and it's almost like. You know, you're waiting for it around the corner type of deal, right? It's kind of like things have to go down, right? Did because... you grow up getting spanked and feeling like every time you did something bad, you had to be spanked? And therefore, if you we know... had a recession, we just actually all have to go through pain? <laughs> Is that how that works? You know what? My parents watch this, so I will say no comment. <laughs> I think they're one of our five viewers, so I will right. no comment on that one. <laughs> Well, and to the point we were just making, if you look at funds, so there's this really important um, concept called fund flow when you're looking at the movement of money through the economy and where is money moving to. And if you look at the purple, those are bonds, reds, equity, gray is mixed assets, and then you have money market. What's really interesting here is the gold bars, these yellow bars. I mean, look at the amount of money just flowing into money markets. That's people basically flowing money into cash, which I'll show later in later slides that that's not a good idea right now, given the fact that the dollar is actively being devalued. And I'm going to show you commodities and how much they're up year over year, which is pretty insane when you actually look at it. Mm -hmm. And this is dry powder. This is dry powder. 
mm-hmm. right? So we've got two very big areas where people are literally getting more income. They're putting it on the sidelines. Eventually, the psychology is going to kick in with the rest of the market. Like this thing's going to go and it's going to yeah. keep moving because you go back to this slide, which t- seems to suggest we're early cycle bull still. Uh, all of that says, hey, there's a lot of powder left in this keg and it's all dry and it's going to go when it goes. Yep, you're right. I mean, a lot of times market it, indicator. Yeah, a lot of times that that money will hit the money market before it goes into the account. So if people transfer money into a brokerage account, it typically hits the money market first before it's invested in other assets from there. So it's kind of uh, like the gateway drug for the market. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Sort of like the checking account to get it in there a little bit. So. Um, yeah, so sentiment indicator, wow, huge jump in sentiment from 40% to 49%. You know, still not in an extreme, which was at 55 the week after the election, but still pretty high on a, on a historical uh, case. So this is, uh, this is investor sentiment. I think we'll show some others here that will show that sentiment across the board is pretty high. Fear and greed index. You know, not quite as uh, cheery, I would say, as the AII sentiment indicator that we were just looking at, which that is really hard to say. Um, so maybe not quite as frothy, but as you say, Darren, this one maybe is, isn't quite as accurate uh, when it comes to measuring that. What's interesting, though, notice down there the junk bond one, extreme greed. Like, yeah. And we have this saying that you, you start seeing issues in the bond markets before you see it in the equity markets because the bond markets are mm-hmm. the debt markets are infinitely bigger. Right. So if we're having issues there, that's going to be like a symptom of what we might see in the equity markets. And when you have these extremes, that's what we're looking for. It's a contrarian indicator. So if there's extreme greed, like the old Buffett saying says, you know, be fearful when everyone's greedy and be greedy Mm -hmm. when everyone's fearful. That's where this plays out. So we're actually looking for the opposite. So if we see extreme greed, that could be a sign that maybe things are getting overheated a little bit and we might see some risk reduction um, as a necessary step. Yeah. Extreme fear one year ago. So this is a survey of CEOs. Um, so business confidence in, in just in their business and then in the economy overall. And this is the uh, highest level since I believe it was 1983. So um, so good sentiment from business leaders in the U.S. Um, and th- know, this is all the people who know that aren't supposed to tell you they know what they know. This is them correct. telling you they know. Correct. That's that exactly. Kind of Exactly. So, and this is what we were just talking about with the the U.S. households. So this is the percentage, the net worth uh, change in U.S. households. So in Q4, it was up six point nine trillion dollars for five point six percent to one hundred and thirty trillion. Household debt increased at an annual rate of six and a half percent, which is the fastest in thirteen years. Um, the value of equities increased by four point nine trillion and real estate increased by 915 billion. So for the asset holders, 2020 was a very good year, uh, right? And so income wise, net net, uh, uh, net worth wise, uh, there wasn't a lot of pain that came along with that recession. Um, you know, we, w- we always <laughs> have this saying, Chris, we say, look, you keep your politics out of investing, right? Yeah. And this yeah, chart I would say says it looks like if <laughs> yeah if 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 there's one area of, of folks that are not feeling cheery at the moment, uh, that would be that would be Republicans. You see how it switched literally on a dime uh, when Trump got elected. The the Republicans got uh, very uh, the sentiment elevated, and then it reversed when Biden was just recently elected. It's interesting that back in like 2009, in the last recession, that those used to move a lot closer together. And uh, not anymore. I mean, that's just uh, like everything else. It just shows the the complete polarization and how we see things now. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah, there are two bifurcations I would say are absolutely critical to bifurcating in your brain when it comes to investing. It's bifurcate the economy and the stock market, rip them apart, and bifurcate mm-hmm. your politics and you're investing and rip them apart because you're absolutely going to make bad decisions when it comes to investing if you don't rip those two apart. And what this is showing you very clearly that people are more polarized and thus we're more likely to see that connectivity of those political thoughts and those market investing behaviors. And when you look at the data, uh, it's not what you think it would be. We showed a lot of this around November. So you can go back and look at some of our November videos if you're really interested in it. We did come across this 
those who watch this channel know that Chris and I are about like jello when it comes to nailing us down to uh, being Republicans or Democrats because we're like any typical Generation X where we probably don't fit in any of the boxes um, out there. Uh, but what was really interesting out of this is it's showing us the number of students or the percentage of students who have gone back to school as it corresponds to the state and whether or not the state they're in is Republican or Democrat. And if you see this and if you're a California and you live in California and you're a Californian, we've got some issues. But what this chart really brought home for me more than anything is that when we look at the impact of COVID that, and what it had on us, assuming that it, we're done with it on some level, maybe it'll come back a little bit, but it does appear that we're moving through it at this point. The biggest impact is we really threw out those on the fringes in our society through COVID. And if you think about it, you've got here, and at least in California, our children have not really been in school in any meaningful way unless you were fortunate enough to have the money to send them private, um, or you were in one of those counties that just disobeyed the governor orders. Uh, they didn't really get to go to school for this last year. And it's gonna be really interesting to see what lapse in education is. Now, families that can afford to be home and to take care of their kids and to do the teaching and to help with the teaching and to hold the kids responsible, that might have been okay. And the children might have continued to learn through this period of time. But there are a lot of children. I know at one point, and we live in a fairly well-to-do school district where I live, and the my daughter was saying that there was 25% of the class that just wasn't even showing up. We asked one of our clients who was a teacher, and we said, well, what are you doing to get clients to sh or, uh, kids to show up? And he's like, I literally, they don't show up, I email them, I'm calling their parents, I'm hounding them. So thank goodness for teachers like that who are actually really trying to push and keep kids in class. But there's a lot of kids that have just literally disappeared off the face of the earth when it comes to school during COVID mm -hmm. times. And you can't help but look at this and not see the political polarization here when it comes to getting kids back in the classroom and what that means. This is something I think that we need to take a good, strong look at here in California, because uh, certainly there's a whole lot of states have had kids back in school for a long time, and there doesn't seem to be crazy outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Enough of that. I'll get off the political <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so this is another bullish indicator here. So what this is showing is the number of stocks at new 52 week highs um, and so that has continued to expand meaning that you know it's not just the top tech stocks that were leading us last year but rather it's it's kind of broader market and and we'll show some other slides to show the different areas but really it's starting to broaden out in terms of the the recovery in the stock market so more and more stocks hitting that 52 week high which is what you want to see you don't want to see too much concentration it's a little bit fragile in the recovery when that happens and uh, and so this is another chart that's that would be a bullish indicator and value uh, value starting to uh, come back against growth so it had the best month in, so Chris uh, what is value and growth for those who don't understand it because it's a little bit kind of a wonky term even those yeah. in the industry kind of like oh, all right what are you really saying when you say growth and value right right and and uh so in in the investment world it's almost like um different types of religion right you're you're either a value person or you're a growth person right and if you're a growth person you never invest in value stocks and vice versa and that that is probably not a good approach when it comes to investing but but there's a lot of different ways to measure it and a lot of different ways to invest in it but bottom line is basically growth stocks are stocks that are going to grow quickly um, they typically don't pay a dividend they usually take on a lot of debt because there's a lot of there's a lot of rapid growth within the company so different ways you can measure it the value companies are kind of the opposite of that typically you're trying to buy a dollar's worth of value for 80 cents right so if you think of traditional growth versus value you might be thinking of like um, an amazon versus like a walmart you know um so so new versus old a lot of times is what it, it what it kind of boils down to but typically over longer periods of times there's been something called the value premium which is basically like investors get paid more because they're taking on these companies that don't have as rosy of an outlook and uh, that makes sense right you should get paid more if you're going to invest in a company that doesn't have as good of a prospects in the future um, so but recently over the last 10 years and last year happened to be the biggest uh, relative outperformance for growth 
I, I forget how long, but it's a very, very long time. But nonetheless, growth has completely outperformed value for about the last decade and to the point where they're even wondering if that value premium even exists anymore. Well, in theory, it's it probably doesn't. more than you wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but in theory, it, the value premium doesn't exist until it does, because even even though we're supposedly getting this rotation, which I could argue both ways between value and growth, the stuff that's I mean, you really, if you remove a few core components of those value stocks, we're not really seeing that rotation yet. I think it will be interesting as we go into let's call it the millennial economy, where we have technology and. Um, zoomification of the world um, type of work environments for these professionals, how that shifts, how we look at growth, how we look at value, how stocks perform, don't perform. I think also this whole retail versus retail, this retail versus institutional trader. And what is the actual influence on retail? Nobody really knows that we, what is retail really doing? Retail says, ah, it's not really us. We're not having that big of an influence. And institutions say, ah, maybe you're having more of an influence than you think. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it's this whole battle uh, going on out there. The institutions don't really want retail to know that they do manipulate the market um, because that's how they make lots of money. Uh, And retail saying, well, we're going to fight back. And that's the whole GameStop battle that Chris loves to talk about so much. (laughs) How'd you tie all that back to GameStop? Oh, we lost your audio, buddy. Amazing. You're Uh, out again. All right. So um, this is just looking at value versus growth um, and the yields and looking to have those yields come back um, to each other. Let's see. Is, was that my audio, Chris? Hey, can you hear me okay? I'm just wondering. You might you be hear here. Me? Give me a thumbs yes, up. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, he can hear me. Yep. Can someone give us a thumbs up on the chat if you can hear us? We just need to make sure we're... Yeah, we got to check the... Check uh... my connection here because I can't hear you, Chris. Okay. Um, I'm showing connected. I'm wondering if I should be good. I can't hear hear you, Chris. Can you reset your audio on your headset maybe? Yep. Just replug it back in. So looking at the growth view, yields versus value, um, the, all right, so we'll keep, going here if anyone's on can you just i see 14 of you so if someone could just send us through a chat on anything and say you can hear us that would be super great any all right so let's take a look at earnings versus growth chris can we hear you yet i don't think so i don't think you can hear me chris let's do this this unadd you to the stream and we'll add you back in okay all right chris will be back in a second with us and then we'll let's now try that are you there chris yes can you hear me can you hear nope. me? All right. I'm going to, um, Chris, just come come in and come back out. Um, so earnings growth um, is basically um, what we're looking for is uh, obviously we want to see where the earnings growth is happening throughout the economy uh, because that helps us understand what's who's going to perform and what's going to perform uh, in the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is made up of 11 different sectors. So when you hear the S&P 500, that's the largest 500 US-based companies. And these are the sectors respectively. You can see industrials, consumer discretionary materials, S&P, so forth. And so what we're really looking for is what are the sectors that are outperforming because that helped from an earnings standpoint and that helps us understand what might be coming in the future. All right. Um, Chris, it looks like you're back. Can you hear us, Chris? Yes. Can no, you hear me? We can't hear Still you. nothing. Okay. <laughs> oh, but Mark says he can hear us both. Hmm. So I can't hear you. So I'm going to try and mess with my audio. Um, so Chris, you take this chart and I'll <laughs> mess with my audio now. Um, cause mine's saying connected, but. All right. Sounds good. All right, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you. Sorry, everybody. We're, uh, we'll get this fixed here in just a sec. It just wouldn't be life without some hiccup. All right. Chris, can you hear me? Yes. So you yes. can hear me, but I can't hear you. Right. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. 
All right. So uh, why don't you keep going and I'll just keep changing the cut charts. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. So this is the Russell 2000 price to sales ratio. So remember, we talked a little bit about there's some signs of frothiness. There's some signs of early stage recovery. This is one of those signs that's like, gosh, it's hard to tell. Now, one of the things that could be throwing this off is that the numbers from the the previous year um, are thrown off because of COVID. So maybe some of these things are going to correct um, as we come out of COVID and as, as sales recover, as earnings recover, uh, et cetera, that we're going to start to, we're going to start to see some of these numbers come back to earth. But as of right now, uh, a lot of these valuation metrics just look pretty insane, uh, pretty highly valued. And, uh, that, that would be one pause, um, in terms of, you know, looking at, at, at the overall markets and giving you some caution, right? So, and you might say, well, but the companies are better now, right? So I <laughs> wanted to show the constituents of the Russell 2000, that, that chart that we were just showing. And look what shows up at number four, my favorite, GameStop, is a half a percent of the overall index. So an index is just a collection of stocks that, that it tracks the, the price changes in these stocks. And so these are the consti constituents within the Russell 2000 index. Uh, Penn National Gaming is one of the favorites of uh, of, of your boy Dave Port Portnoy, uh, Darren. So he's he's been why is promoting he my boy? One. He is not my boy. That, <laughs> that, 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 he, there's nothing about that guy that is my boy, other than he's slightly irreverent. But <laughs> yeah, no, he's entertaining, entertaining for sure. Um, but anyway, these these are not exactly like you know your your long term dividend paying you know stodgy old American stocks that you're going to see, uh, you know that should be topping it at amazing prices, right? So, um, yet to be determined what what we'll what we'll see going forward. Um, well, and th those are those zombie companies, right? Those, so yeah. Some of those are floating out there. We know are going to blow at some point. And Correct. it's just a matter of what that impetus and catalyst is that blows them up. And then it, I think it eventually we have either dominoes or we have a completely small cap, mid cap world backed by the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've we've also seen um, this is the this is the uh, Nasdaq, the QQQs, as they're sometimes called, the Qs uh, in the slang, right? So. When you look at the the put volume, so a put is when when you uh, buy a put, that means that you can put your stock to someone else at a certain price. So you would buy a put if you are concerned about the price going down, right? And so um, you make money when the price goes down, basically, or you use it as a hedge to to protect you. Um, so uh, depending on if you're on the buy or sell side. So with with the amount of puts that we're seeing in the in the Nasdaq right now is actually higher than what we saw in March of 2020 which is kind of mind blowing. Hmm. That is. Well, I think March 2020 really caught the market off guard and that's what created so many what we call or um Corey Hofstein actually calls uh, liquidity cascades, right? Where it just becomes this selling that builds on itself. Yeah. And then you have the Fed step in. Uh, it wasn't one of the it was some argue it wasn't what we call black swan. I would argue it kind of was in some ways. Um, at least the politicians saw it coming. And it wasn't a black swan to them because they all traded their portfolios prior. Um, <laughs> but you know, whatever. We're not we're not bitter or anything about that. So the uh, <laughs> and you can definitely see that put those puts going up. There's a lot of what we call perma bears out there. Uh, but every time, I, I mean, it's almost like clockwork. The market starts to fall apart, and then we get some type of movement back up in a strong way. It's not ready to go. I, I, you know, the market trend upward is going to keep going, I think, until every last person believes that it's going to keep going. And then that's the moment that mm -hmm. is going to come down. Yeah. So new consumer sentiment numbers came out uh, for, uh, for March. I think it was actually covering February. So we saw a tick up, which is positive. Still pretty far below what we, what we were a year ago uh, prior to COVID. Um, however, uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So hopefully that continues. This is the, this is the U S consumer. So this is an investor sentiment. This is somebody that's going to be out there spending money. People are feeling pretty confident or bet or more confident. Especially than they were if you got a stimmy a check. Yeah, exactly.
Some families, I mean, are I mean, you really start adding it up if you have a handful of kids, you're looking at like ten thousand dollars in a stimmy check. I mean, that's some big money for some families. I took one call yesterday where they're like, "Hey, I'm gonna get enough in stimmy checks to pay off all my school debt. What do you think? Why pay off your debt, man?" <laughs> like, well. <laughs> Let's just be clear that having kids is not investment advice because I don't care how much they give you on a stimmy check. That is prob- You're probably upside down there. <laughs> Especially if they're mostly girls like your family, right? Yes, exactly. You're, no way you're coming out ahead on that, putty. <laughs> uh, so we've got the, the, ten, the two-year, 10-year spread, uh, treasury yield spread. So this is widely tracked for something called a yield curve inversion. So when that's going down, when we get close to or below zero, that has predicted uh, a lot of the, the recent recessions. Um, it, it's a very reliable predictor of future recessions. Now, we never know that it could always get thrown off, but we're starting to, we've seen a steepening there, meaning that there's more of a spread between a two-year and a 10-year treasury, which is what you would expect. You expect to get paid more for a 10-year treasury. Um, so as those have steepened, as the longer rates have started to steepen, we've seen the market kind of digest that uh, higher rates because higher rates are typically, at least in the short term, a little bit of a challenge for asset prices because you know it changes it changes the the environment right you know that that these companies are working within you know it's interesting about this chart and you look at these different periods of time where we've had these really drastic rate moves if you want to call it that um, these drastic rate moves seem to suggest um, that we're coming out of a recession, right? So this would then go to that argument that this is early cycle again, right? Early late cycle theme, mm-hmm. and that's pretty positive. Now, a lot of market watchers really get concerned if these rates move too fast upwards, right? It's all about not the fact that they're just going up, it's how fast they're going up and can the economy digest um, the more expensive debt. Um, and yeah. that's the key, but what's interesting is and almost looks like in every case we hit these recessions and then rates go up really fast. And then every yep. time everyone goes, oh, no, they're going up fast again. <laughs> like, well, no, that's what happens when the market recovers. Great point. Great point. So this chart was awesome from Michael Venuto, which shows the uh, 30-year bond return going back to 1974. And so this is another chart that you would see we're following the same pattern that we were following coming out of 2009. So we already looked at the equity markets, the S&P 500 roughly following that same pattern. And now you're looking at the 30-year bond, which is kind of the flip side of that, and which is also following uh, that same pattern, at least so far. So that's interesting if you put it in the evidence of we're, we're more early cycle than late cycle. Um, that, that's definitely in the, in the early cycle column. You know what the one is, you know so if we're putting these columns and we're saying we early cycle we late cycle one of the late cycle um, behaviors that we're observing is all this retail kind of trading right this kind of frenzy trading this blow off top type trading that's stuff you tend to see in late cycle historically when people are kind of in that euphoria stage but it's interesting this time because it's different it doesn't feel the same um, as it has in the past when we've had those blow off euphoria like behaviors it's almost like there's so, there's just a wall of cash coming into the economy and thus the markets because it's getting unevenly distributed to those who have and versus those who don't have. And they're taking that money and just plowing it into hard assets. Well, you're going to buy a house? Well, good luck because there's not many houses out there to buy right now. Uh, and what else are you going to do with it? You're going to plow it into money markets. Okay, now do you want to put it in the stock market? No, I don't want to put it in the stock market because I feel like it's heavily valuated. Well, that. What this is suggesting is that well, we could be going on for a while because there isn't other places to put it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the in, the increase in rates has been a headwind for tech stocks and growth stocks in general because they have what's called a long duration. Now, this is debated in in the financial world, so I'm sure there's you know professionals out there that would say no, there's no there's no um, correlation, right? But but if you do believe there is correlation, it's because growth stocks have a longer duration, meaning that you're expecting to get your cash flows from that stock further out into the future. And so when that happens, when interest rates go up, you're discounting those cash flows uh, at a higher rate now that the interest rates are higher. And so therefore, 
that stock is worth less today. So um, I know that's a little bit complicated, but I would say there's at least enough evidence out there to, to show that there's a possibility of a correlation here that it, you should at least consider it as an explanation. I think the other thing is that a lot of the value stocks are actually financials, right? Banks are a huge part of the financials. And so if you get an increase in in rates, that's good for banks because that helps their net interest margin and financials in general. It's a lot easier to be an insurance company in a higher interest rate environment than it is in a low interest rate environment. And so those returns are gonna improve on those types of stocks in, in a rising rate scenario. That's right. This is an ugly chart. Yeah, I don't love the color <laughs> scheme, but uh, <laughs> so what this is showing though It's kind of like the Sonoma Dragons though. Well, I, no comment. I don't want to create any enemies. <laughs> you were, okay? I, I, I was a gaucho, <laughs> right? True confession. I was a gaucho over at Casa Grande High School and Sonoma was our rival. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay. Well, so we didn't we didn't create this chart, so no comments about the uh, the colors here. But what this is showing is the the DXY, the the which is one of the indexes that tracks the dollar. And so what it tracks the dollar against though is a basket of other currencies, mainly the euro. The euro makes up something like 60% of that basket in the DXY. And so what this is saying is that if the euro continues to follow its real yield like it has in the past, which is that green line, then that means that likely the, the euro is going to devalue, right? And so therefore the dollar, if it's being measured against the euro, would be going up in that scenario, right? All things being equal now. There's a lot of variables because there's other currencies in there that are moving around at the same time. But nonetheless, it's not like it's a A plus B equals C relationship where it's just gonna, the dollar is gonna continue to sink, right? There's, there's a, it's moving in this environment all around the world where other countries need to keep their currencies from appreciating too much as well. Well, th this is really the currency battle stuff that we talk about, right? Because if you look at it from an economic standpoint, a country wants to devalue their currency, their fiat currency over other countries. So the United States isn't going to let the euro devalue further than the dollar, right? Because that's going to be a headwind politically, create all kinds of issues. So this is the type of chart you would look at and say, huh, this could be interesting from a geopolitical standpoint because that's where your battle is going to play out. The euro, the yuan, and the dollar. And who's going to get to devalue it more? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So new update for the housing market index, uh, which just came out. There, this ticked down a little bit from basically an all-time high, which is kind of what you would expect with interest rates ticking up a bit. Um, it was winter time. You know, not as many houses move around that time. But um, it'll be interesting to see where the housing market goes with what you've been talking about with the commodity prices, the inputs to building those houses. Those prices are out of control right now, things like lumber, copper. Um, and so uh, this will be something to be interesting to track moving forward. And you see this with mortgage rates, right, starting to move up, you know, and that's important. That 30-year mortgage rate, really, that's quite a move. And that'll be a headwind on the refinance market that'll hurt financial institutions that you don't want this to move up too quick because that could be an economic headwind uh, for people going out and buying all these homes. But it could also reduce some, you know, you look at this balancing act, right? Because if there's no houses to buy out there and people have all this free money that's coming to them, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be a reversion to the mean. And you're starting to see that play out. Uh, that will not be good for our friends who do mortgages and whatnot out there, but uh, mm -hmm. that's certainly something to keep an eye on. Yeah, you can see there's been historically at least somewhat of a relationship with the 10-year yield and the 30-year treasury yield. So that's why those those yields are so important um, on those two items because it affects basically credit in every single market around the world. Um, so homeowner boon, so this is the average equity soared um, for Western states, especially last year, um, for all those reasons you were just talking about, Darren, low interest rates, no inventory, people moving because they could, uh, you know, work from homes taking over. And, uh, and so the equity that people have in their house is now 
uh, much in most cases much higher than it was last year, which is not something you would have guessed in uh, this time last year, I would say. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if we get another wave of people moving out of California, right? Especially depending on how this recall vote goes with Newsom, because I feel like people are pretty fed up and on a lot of levels, or at least certain parts of the state are. But then you look at this and you say, okay, well, if you're, um, you know, your equity is soaring, that would be kind of the key, like, hey, I'm getting out of town, I'm going to take my money and run and uh, go move to one of these other states where you don't see quite the appreciation, um, but at least you can get a lot bigger home. Yeah, but then you uh, you look outside and the weather is pretty amazing here. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, right? You, Does that have some... anything to do with you spending some time last year in Ohio, Chris? It could. It absolutely <laughs> right. could. Um, I think when you're born and raised here, you may not appreciate the uh, the, the no, February no, no. and March weather. Most people weather are born and raised, leave and come back. <laughs> <laughs> so. So this chart was actually really interesting because it's showing a home affordability in the U.S. Uh, and, and so the, the state with the least amount of affordability, which I would not have guessed this, is Vermont at something like 16% uh, of people can afford homes there. And, uh, and then the most affordable was Delaware, which I also would not have guessed. Um, so, and then you see the, the colors of the red show you the median home price. So obviously the houses are much more expensive in, in the West, um, and on the East coast and places like New York. Um, however, in California, I'm actually surprised that that number is as high as it is at 33. Cause you, you do hear, right. definitely hear people complain about it a lot. But look at Utah and Colorado. Like who would guess that those two States would have, I mean, pretty close to the same I, I wonder if all that's just all the people flooding out of California mm -hmm. and just infiltrating or look at Wyoming yeah yeah absolutely that is interesting so mortgage originations the credit scores have gone up a lot of the of the people that are getting mortgages so the k-shape recovery again right so if you've got assets you've got income uh, and, and you still do now and you have good credit, wow, it's a great time for you to refinance your mortgage uh, or go buy another house or whatever it may be. However, if you've lost your job, it's kind of tough to get a mortgage, right? Yeah. Well, and I think this is not part of that K recovery, right? What I'd love to look at on an overlay on this chart is, you know, what proportion of the population is actually getting these originations and what their income is, Um because I think that it would show a different different look at the chart. Yeah. So everything sounds great, right? Like we just we we beat the recession. Nothing happened. Uh, we can all move on and uh, and keep going, right? Well, maybe this chart from uh, Long Term Trends uh, is great. It shows the federal debt to GDP. The thing to note here is this only goes up through summer of last year, so it's actually much higher now. Um, and you can see where our debt to GDP is versus other times in our history going back to before 1800, which is really cool. I love charts like this. And um, so we were talking about World War II being kind of the old marker that we eclipsed that last year. And, uh, and now we're in uncharted territory in terms of uh, debt to GDP in the U.S. So. I know there's a lot of folks out there that say that doesn't matter anymore. Um, I, I just am noting that it's that it's happening, right? And so we've got debt to GDP at those levels. We've got the federal uh, budget deficit um, as a percentage of our GDP is also at all-time highs at 16.5%. So um, that that's a record and uh, started during COVID and it's just continued to go. So we are definitely all in on the debt and deficits don't matter anymore. Nothing to see here. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out. Well, you know, it's interesting, Chris, because you, you, and, and the reason why I would argue that is the only way to deal with this debt and deficit that you see here is to inflate the U.S. dollar in a way that is just unbelievable that any of us can even possibly conceive right now. And if that inflation process happens, that has so many other major implications. So if you're a fiscal hawk and you're saying, look, we're going to let this thing rebalance, you're a fiscal conservative, you're going to let this thing rebalance, I don't think you know what you're asking for with this kind of debt levels. And that's why I tend to think that we're going to see more modern monetary theory and just relabel it 
so that it doesn't look like a Bernie Sanders thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's really anything. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as a fiscal conservative in Congress anymore. I don't think that anything will change until it's forced upon the U.S. through some sort of crisis, if that ever happens. Um, but as long as the debt, the the interest rates are low on the debt, and there's really no ramifications for continuing to borrow, especially in the short term, um, I think they're going to continue to do it. I mean, Bush doubled the, the uh, debt. Uh, Obama doubled the debt. Trump doubled the debt. Everybody's doing it. So it's not like there's anybody that's going to come in and say, yeah, let's start Let's start paying this down, right? And like you said, it's kind of like it's in a situation now where it's so far out of control, um, you know. And you could argue too, when we came out of World War II, um, the U.S. had a huge baby boom after that to to help kind of work that debt off. Um, we went through a massive inflation in the '70s, kind of was like the tail end of of working all that off. The U.S. was really one of the only countries left intact after World War II. I mean, Europe was completely decimated. So um, there was a lot of other factors at that time that would allow us to come out of that debt um, in a little more managed way. And now, it's, that's not really the case. So, mm -hmm. uh, so this chart just shows the percentage change. Um, national debt in trillion, so we're up to 28 trillion now, and how many days it took us to get from uh, one trillion to the next, right? So, uh, and the percentage change between each milestone. So the way the snowballs build is that, you know, you can see it's only 3.7% to go from 27 to 28 trillion. So now it's not that big a deal to add a trillion dollars to the, the debt uh, as a percentage of our overall. You know, this is totally random and a side note, Chris, but I was just thinking about 16% of people in Vermont can afford a house. Isn't that Bernie Sanders' home state? Yes, good call. Like, what's up with that, right? Like, here's yes. the guy who's screaming up and down, but you got Vermont and one of the lowest affordability of buying a house in the whole country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Biden's from Delaware, though, so you got that. It's true. They have nice uh, corporate tax law there. <laughs> so, so this is the crux of it, though. When debt is this cheap, we can we can run these huge deficits without much of a ramification because our payments don't really go up, and so we've benefited from a lower interest rate environment as a country in terms of our borrowing. Um, however, is that going to play out forever? I don't know. Well, in the other piece that I I don't think you can dismiss in all of this is the biggest, you know, 100 pound gorilla in the room or whatever. It all comes down to or as the Reddit people would say the biggest ape in the room is it comes down to the factor that we have the dollar that it's the reserve currency of the world that we can control the dollar. We lose control of that whether it's the yuan or the euro, we got problems with all of this piping. And that's, I think, what leads into this whole idea that I've talked a lot about in the fourth turning and this geopolitical tension that comes from currency battles. All of this building debt in every single country just heightens the pressure in that whole dialogue and that whole discussion, which ultimately will crack on some level. It's just a question of how it cracks, when it cracks, and to what degree it cracks. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So we saw a huge uh, retraction in GDP last year. China was the only country to at least post a positive GDP growth last year. Uh, however, we're thinking that in 21 and 22, the, with all the stimulus that we should be above average growth on GDP, I don't know. I, I'm Call me a skeptic. If, if you could just print money and borrow money into wealth, uh, why wouldn't anybody have just thought of this in the past, right? What were we waiting for? If we could just pay people to stay home and... Uh, you know, just borrow our way into prosperity. Don't you think the prior generations would have thought of that already and tried that? <laughs> it's all a grand experiment, right? <laughs> Seems what's like the, it. What's interesting too about this chart, if you think about it, we were talking about this earlier on, 6%, 8%, that's the range that they're calling for the GDP growth in the United States. Yeah. Compare that to every other year in at least the recent history. It's absolutely unbelievable. And mm -hmm. if that does happen, 
the amount of inflation that we see, the amount of just, you know, trying to build a house is going to be near impossible because you won't be able to order anything you need because it's just being bought off the shelves immediately. Yep. So we've looked at the top side of the K and now if we spend a few slides kind of going through the bottom side of the K, right? So we've got the uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance are still remaining elevated. Um, we're still in that above 700,000 range. Um, we saw births in the U.S. drop off. So just to read these statistics here, birth, births in the USA dropped by 3.8% in 2020. Um, the drop was 6% in November and 8% in December. Um, so the next chart will kind of show that graphically, same same basic information there. But, um, you know, people uh, in the long term, demographics is going to help to drive productivity and growth. And uh, you're seeing this all over the world is that the population is uh, is not growing as quickly as it used to. And um, that may be, you know, the feeling of, of uh, resource constraints. I'm not sure what's driving that. Um, it could be pollution and, and things that are affecting our genetics. Um, did you, you know, listen to the Demography eating. Unplugged podcast this week, Chris? Yeah, uh, not this week. I did not. You know how he talked all about this and how okay, let's there's check it some out. issues with environmental stuff going on where it's just mm. making it really hard for people to have kids. Yeah, yeah. Grant they want talks to not, about that too. It's just not yeah. happening. Yeah, which is really concerning. Yeah. Um, so we've got the uh, forward inflation expectations, right? And so. That's that's the consensus view right now is that we are going to see massive inflation uh, as measured by the CPI, which, you know, I think we'll see. I think you and I agree that we'll see inflation somewhere. Uh, whether or not it shows up in CPI is debatable. Yeah, I, I think that's really the discussion, and that's why I want to put this chart on because, he, you know, this is if you look at these are all commodities: natural gas, ethanol, Brent crude oil, gasoline heating, aluminum, steel, gold, silver, gold, coal, copper, sugar, corn, all the core components of our society and, and consumption. And look at these one year percentages. You go mm -hmm. back to CPI. I don't know, kind of feels like a disconnect to me. Then you look at the dollar and you've got the devaluation of the dollar. So you got inflation, not showing up in CPI. Why? Well, the government if they chain all their benefit programs to some type of CPI, if that goes up too high, then that means all the social security payments have to go up. That means all kinds of pensions have to go up. There's mm -hmm. your inflation, there's your dollar being valued. So you got these two forces working against, remember all those money market funds sitting in money markets that are making zero money? They're actually losing a lot of money. And why? Because the deflation of commodities, the cost to live, right? You go out there and try to buy food, try to buy, try to remodel, I'm remodeling a bathroom right now that has been a nightmare just to get stuff for and get it ordered all oh, month out for this month out for that. Right. And then on top of that, you've got commodities that are just going through the roof as far as appreciation. And then you have the dollar being devalued. So it means your dollar, you can actually purchase less with that dollar. And then you have the government saying, Oh, CPI is just at two. Mm -hmm. And you have Janet Yellen coming out and saying, ah, we see a spike, but not a bad spike. I think in the real economy, from the real people who live day to day and try to live and support their families and loved ones, it's a different story. Yeah. What's interesting with the dollar, too, is because it's the global reserve currency and a lot of other uh, economies borrow in dollars. And so they have to pay back in dollars, right? And so if you see interest rates go up, you're going to see an increased demand for dollars. And I think that's what you've been seeing here over these last few weeks as interest rates have gone up. The, the dollar uh, strength has gone up. And I, I forget who coined the term dollar wrecking ball, but basically if, that get, if the dollar gets too strong because of the other countries that have borrowed in US dollars, that can create havoc um, out there in the economy. Well, and, and that's the whole kind of interconnectedness. You know, people who like to be isolationist, you can't have a reserve currency and be isolationist. As much hassle I've given the politicians for sending money all over the place when they do these stimulus bills. They have to, right? This is all the machinery that keeps everything going. 
And if you've got the dollar just going up, it just creates a nightmare um, economically and makes it very difficult. So that forces the dollar down further as well, um, along with trying to stimulate the economy, because if the dollar's weaker, it allows our people producing and our companies producing to effectively be more competitive globally. From a charts perspective, though, what I think is really interesting, it's been a long time since we really went above our 100 period moving average, which is this gold line, and this is on our daily chart. And you can see the gold line here, we tested it, that's that 100 period moving average. I could argue that this is just a shallow test of that 100 period moving average, which would then suggest that because we found support on the 100 period moving average, we're going to take on this 200 period moving average next. There are some that are arguing as fast as the rates have moved up over the past few weeks, that the fact that the dollar really hasn't moved that far in the scheme of things, that that's really actually a very weak signal that it's telling us that, yeah, we have a short term pump in rates, we have a short term pump in inflation, but the dollar is actually going to get beat down again. And we're going to drop below um, these levels like 90 and then go further down. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, However, I will say from a technical perspective, it's been a long time since we took out the 100 period moving average and held it. You can see last time yeah. was, you know, well, I wouldn't say super long time ago, but a year ago, right? We haven't been up there for a year. Yep. And, right before uh, March, right before mm -hmm. March, that was the last time we had a cross up in the, the 20 day and the 50 day as well. So uh, that was a sign of some pretty big dislocations there. So this is inflation expectations, uh, five year break evens. And so, um, Basically, that's the spread on tips versus nominal yields um, on the five year. What's interesting is it's as high as it's been since 2008 in terms of the inflation expectations. Now, tips are based on CPI, and I think that's key uh, because back in 2008, everybody was saying, We're going to see inflation, we're going to see inflation. Uh, you know, be prepared, the bailouts of the banks and everything. And there's so much money in the system. We're going to be living in Weimar, Germany. Um, and, and yet none of that happened, right, uh, in terms of inflation in the CPI. We saw massive asset price inflation in equities, right? So from 2009 till 2020, uh, huge bull market in equities. Uh, so asset price inflation, we saw it other places, but we definitely didn't see it in the CPI. And I think that that's probably, if I had to bet, that's that's where I would think things are going to go. You're going to see inflation in the things that you need, deflation in the things that you want. Well, in the tips market is completely and completely traded by the Fed. The Fed messes with the tips market all day long, right? So mm -hmm. this is a highly manipulated market. This is not a sign. And that's what you see these rates going up, but at the same time, you don't see tips going up like that. That's that sign that there's that disconnect. The market's saying, nah, 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 we don't believe you, Fed. We think there's actually more inflation going on. You know, funny story on this. I actually remember back in 08, I put a specific trade on for inflation on tips. And I thought for sure inflation was going to rock. And I nice. put a trade on it and it never showed up. And it was like... That's what I mean, right? That was consensus back then. That's right. You That's when that... I had to repent of my fundamentalist perspective on the market <laughs> and become a technical guy. <laughs> that's that's the, the straw that broke you, huh? <laughs> that's when I turned to the technical dark side, Chris. My 08 tips trade. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So inflation topic trending, you know, again, it's it's definitely everybody's looking for it, um, which would argue that you're probably not going to see it. Uh, the CPI month over month, right in right in line, and you saw the market rally last week when that came out. That it really wasn't showing anything. Uh, and the reason why the market doesn't want to see too much inflation is a lot of reasons, but mostly because they believe the Fed will increase, uh, will tighten supply, the money monetary supply, uh, tighten conditions in order to fight the inflation. So uh, it's also a crowded trade, um, betting on higher rates and a steeper yield curve. So this is one of those areas where usually when you see extremes, the market goes the opposite direction. That old saying that the market's going to do what humiliates the most people right and so uh definitely a crowded trade at the moment well the, the the trick is the trend's your friend until it's not right you don't know when it's over and so you got to keep riding the trend because you can't just get off because it's been expressed too far um, so it wouldn't be um and on the economy without a little bitcoin 
And <laughs> so I just wanted to give everyone a little update. And I thought this chart was really helpful on having, right? So there, you know, one of the, you're hearing a lot about Bitcoin um, earlier this week. We hit another all time new high, pulled back since then. People saying, ah, oh, it's over, it's a blow off top. And if you understand the fundamentals of what's happening in Bitcoin, it becomes a very different dialogue, a very different story. There's a lot of maximalists out there, people who are just like, it's religious, they're kind of nutty about it. And there's other people out there, they're extreme haters <laughs> on it. And it's you like know, your boyfriend or girlfriend is ugly, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 your kids won't do their homework, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think they do more to harm <laughs> Bitcoin, but whatever. So there's these halving cycles. And so the best way to explain halving cycles, if you have Bitcoins being mined every 10 minutes. So in the first halving cycle, every 10 minutes, there was 50 Bitcoins being mined. And now there's 20, there was 25 in the second, then 12 and a half in the third. And now we're at 6.25 every 10 minutes. And so what you're, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. And so what's happening is the scarcity of Bitcoin it's getting more and more scarce. There's less and less supply. So there's this built-in supply shock happening to the market as it matures. And as it matures, you're getting all these people hearing about it, learning about it, understanding it. And then supply is going down. It's getting harder and harder to get it. And that's what creates the scarcity and drives up demand for it. Right. So from a fundamentalist perspective, from an economic perspective, it is brilliant in how it's economically structured. Right. And if you understand that structure, then you understand what's happening and why the price is appreciating. And it doesn't just sound like this gibberish that you hear, you know, your cousin Johnny, who's 20 years old, going, I bought Bitcoin and I put all my money on Bitcoin. Like, no, it's this economic commodity that's actually going in and it's helping people preserve their overall wealth. So then we look at it and we say, okay, well, let's take a look at the price appreciation of Bitcoin and where we are in comparison to that next halving cycle. And so you can see these each of those halving cycles. So it's 291 days until that halving, 297 days until that halving. And here's where we're at right now. Um, so you can see we have a long ways to go. Um, before we get into and we are at a top, as they say, if Bitcoin continues to be Bitcoin, it's always the possibility that you have something like what happened to the Indian government. Um, this in India, they are trying to outlaw crypto. I don't think they're going to be able to do it, um, but it's certainly possible. The long term trend is up because of the scarcity that's being created in each of the halving cycles. And that's what's going on with it. And it's effectively the best way to think about Bitcoin is it's just this it's it's computers doing mathematical calculations and then every time they get a certain number of uh, mathematical calculations done there's a bitcoin awarded to the network and that is represented by an address on a network right and there's only 21 million of those addresses right those Bitcoins can be split up into Satoshis and create more finite number of them, but that's the idea. So eventually you hear people talking about owning one Bitcoin right now. Mark my words, eventually people are going to be talking about owning one Satoshi. You heard it here. <laughs> so, um, so Bitcoin hitting all time new highs. So how many all time new highs does it hit in its having cycle in the first part of its having cycle? So you can see in this first or the, this look at the second having cycle, because I think it's a little bit um, more mature. The first one was, you know, just a bunch of techno nerds. But so you have 52 all time highs, then 74 all time new highs. And right now we've only done 29 all time highs. So when people say to me, well, like, oh, it's over, it's going to blow off. N n there's really nothing suggesting that at this point. We're very early stage. We still got a long time to go. Um, based upon this data, the having data, you would think that we'd start to see a blow off top somewhere August, September, um, October, November. However, um, those having cycles, um, they don't all perform the same way and we don't all get to our peaks at the same high time. And you can see in these three different stages or having cycles, you can really see in this having cycle and see it took a little bit longer to get that runoff blow off. This is that last one in 2012 to, um, to 2016. And we're right at that point now where we might start seeing some really crazy price appreciation on it. But when you compare where we're at right now, um, historically and how close to that having cycle we are um, to that next having, uh, it would seem um, that we have some time to go yet because this is showing you the number of days after the halving. So it's that first part of the halving, you get that real run up and then that collapse in price and then it consolidates and then rebuilds after the next halving. And that's what 
it's happened the last three times. Will it continue to happen that way? Who knows? But that's what has happened. And I think just like with the Fed seems to step in every time the market sell off, sells off, we would think that they're going to refill that cookie jar until they don't refill that cookie jar. And we should expect that Bitcoin is going to behave like Bitcoin until it's not Bitcoin anymore for whatever reason, whether it's a geopolitical reason, whether there's some kind of hack in the software, who knows? Uh, but that's the story behind it. That's the fundamental analysis that is driving the price appreciation. So, and that is a wrap on today's On the Economy. Thanks for bearing with us um, for that short momentary uh, glitch in our, um, I guess it was my ability to hear you, Chris. I don't know what it was, but um, I reset mine and it seemed to work. So we appreciate all of you. We hope you have a safe and wonderful uh, rest of your week. Uh, and we'll see you back on the market on Friday where we take a look at the charts and break down the technical analysis. If we can help in any way, please reach out. Our info at Sonoma Wealth Advisors is in the bottom of the screen, flashing across, and we'd be happy to chat. Chris, any last things you've got? Nope. I think that wraps it up. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great evening.